spread their farmlands wide. Along the coast and in the valleys, men build with faith in this green island. Their work still stands today to prove that faith. Through the first century of settlement, Tasmania grew into a prosperous agricultural state with farmers coming from many lands, drawn by the countryman's dream of rich, well-watered soil and reliable rainfall. In the mountain heart of our island, a thousand streams and torrents join forces. From the abundant waters of lake and river, Tasmania's history has grown. Our future lies here too. For every drop of rain that falls on the catchment area brings new power stored for man to harness. A hundred years ago, the pioneers drew power in primitive fashion from the force of waters. Today, Tasmania's waters are harnessed one family, but by a community. New rivers run to order, and man-made lakes hold back the wealth of waters. There is power in the mountains, power for the people of Tasmania. The Hydroelectric Commission has built a complex system of works to supply our growing need for power. Water flows to the power stations by canal and plume, by tunnel and pipe. Each route presents an individual problem for the engineer. The flow of water broadens at the Four Bay Pond. Then, a thousand feet, the water drops down the penstocks to dry turbines of the station in the valley. Here, a handful of men are in control of 126,000 horsepower. Double 7.15, plume 1.9 feet, 200 cusecs, Clarence pipeline flow, 49 cusecs. D Lagoon, 2152, Pine Pier Dam, 2193.1, local storage, 65... The power from the turbine-driven generators starts on its way to consumers through the station switchyard, then to the transmission cable strung on towers and away across the countryside in seven league strides to the cities and towns of the state. Power for Deloraine and Devonport. Power for Burnie with its busy wharves, for Alveston and Launceston. Over the hills to big town and small and down to Hobart, thriving capital. Power for transport and for homes. Power for lathes and looms and lifts. Power for trams and traffic lights. And power to drive the state's heavy industry. Zinc is one of our key industries, employing 3,500 Tasmanians, drawing enough power each day to light a city. Metal alloys, aluminium, carbide, titanium oxide, cement, knitting wools, textiles. These and many other products we make with 1,600 industries humming with power from the mountains. Take the newsprint mill at Boyer, for example, or the Bell Bay aluminium plant. 
or the big paper mill at Burnie. These are three vast industries built on hydroelectric power. Over the past 40 years, our whole pattern of life has changed, especially in the home. We all take it for granted, of course, but what is there that can bring more leisure into life than electricity? Power is the mainspring that drives the household of today. The man of the house relies on electric power too in his work as a textile designer. The gay world of fashion would be unthinkable without machines to sew and machines to spin, machines to weave and print and decorate the new fabrics that bring colour and excitement into a woman's life. Textile printing is one of many flourishing industries that have taken root in Tasmania since the war. Hydroelectric power has brought about a peaceful industrial revolution in Tasmania. In food processing, and even more in farming, electricity has increased our production figures. Ask Eddie Marshall how he'd like to go back to the days of hand milking. And no more smoky coppers for us, Marshall. Just turn on the hot water tap. Today, it's power that pumps and chills the water for the milk cooler and keeps the milk safe in the cool room through hot summer days. Cooling rooms pay dividends on the dairy farm. Wherever the power poles go on country roads, you'll find more ideas for farmers. Tomato growers get their crops on the market earlier by using soil heating apparatus. On the pig farm, the round farrowing house keeps the piglets from being crushed and warms them with an infrared ray lamp. More than half the Commission's consumers live in country areas and pay no more for electricity than city consumers. In irrigating and pumping, power flows from many stations to serve them. Trevallon Station harnesses the South Esk River. Its four reaction turbines feed the vast plant of the Australian Aluminium Commission at Bell Bay and light the city of Launceston. At Wadamana, place of the big river, two stations draw power from the waters of the Great Lake. Tangatina, the place of falling water, harnesses a chain of lakes to drive its five Francis turbines. Lake Echo Station on the shores of Dee Lagoon. Butler's Gorge Station, powered by the waters of Lake King William, where a power of beauty flows, curbed and controlled by man. With dam and spillway, weir and canal, engineers have controlled the destiny of every river and creek that flows in the catchment of the central plateau. With its plentiful lakes and rivers, the catchment has a tremendous storage capacity, making it possible for us to produce power at very low cost. Lakes and Clare, Lake Echo, and the Great Lake, in Brady's and Bronte, Little Pine and Laughing Jack Lagoon, the rains and rivers are collected and held, sometimes by nature, sometimes by the engineer, to await transformation into energy.
Enormous supplies are still untapped in our rivers and our growing need for power demands their exploitation. The Commission's hydrologists estimate the volume of the rivers through the season. Following their calculations, the surveyors move in to chart possible sites for dams and power stations. At head office, draftsmen work on plans for penstocks, plumes and forebays. Here, 80 million tons worth of works have been designed, bringing industrial expansion to the state. Work is in progress on the Weyatina scheme, a major project involving two new power stations. The Weyatina stations will use water which has already generated electricity at Butler's Gorge and Taralea, at Lake Echo and Tungatina. On the Nive River, a concrete weir will divert water to the upper station. Drillers tunnel through four miles of dolerite rock. At the other end of the tunnel, earth and rock are being moved to clear the way for the penstocks of the upper station. Down the slope, the pipes will carry the water to the new Weyatina A station. The two Weyatina stations will be followed by other stations using the same water yet again to produce more power. The valley will be flooded to make a lake, a lake created by an earth and rock filled dam being built across the Derwent River a mile downstream. The core of the dam is built thick screen of rocks. Besides earth and rock fill construction, we're across the valley of the River Ouse. Construction is speeded up by prefabricating concrete sections of the flume. Prefabrication is used a great deal. Sections for transmission towers are galvanized and assembled at the Commission's Hobart plant, then transported to the field for erection. Cradles for supporting pipelines are also constructed in Hobart. At Weyatina, thousands of these cradles are used on the wood stave pipeline that will carry water between the new stations. The wooden pipes, reinforced with steel bands, bring the water a mile to the surge tank and the penstocks lead it to the turbines. To house employees and their families, the Commission has built several villages in the Central Highlands that exist to make a pleasant community life.
healthy crop of young Tasmanians is growing up in our hikes and rivers that the engineers are harnessing with the helping hand of men from many countries. As the power from the mountains increases, so our island grows. Since the war, more than 600 new industries have been established in Tasmania, each of them bringing wider scope of work and greater opportunities for Tasmanians. Throughout the state, the noise of building fills the air. Besides new factories and offices, we are building new homes, where our population has increased by more than one quarter since the war. Alongside these homes, we are building schools, hospitals, blocks of flats to keep pace with our rising numbers. If Colonel Collins and his men were to sail up the Derwent River again today, they would not be disappointed.